and we are located in the greater Houston area. Thank you, Yvonne. I want to move on to Jennifer now. Jennifer, uh, you are with Caldwell Companies, and um, can you give us a little background on you and your company? Sure. Yeah, my name is Jennifer Simmons, and I am the Vice President of Marketing for Caldwell Companies, which is a real estate development company here in Houston, and it's my job to market our master plan communities. Um, we work with a variety of builders in Houston, some of which are production, some of which are custom, and we offer homes from the 200s to the millions. So the two communities that we're mainly going to be talking about today are Town Lake, which is a 2,400-acre master plan community in Cypress, Texas, and it's centered around a fully recreational lake where residents can boat and water ski and have a house on the water, and then Willow Creek Ranch, which is an all-custom home community, um, gated, and it has acreage lots from one to five acres and homes starting from the 600s. Jennifer, one question I had for you, too, is how many total projects does Caldwell manage from a residential standpoint? We have seven residential communities at the moment. Ooh, I love the language, too, residential communities. Very, yeah. very, very well, very well scripted. Well, it's wonderful. So, again, if you have questions for Yvonne and Jennifer, this is your time to ask them. And go ahead and type your questions in or topics that you would like to make sure we cover as we go. We're going to do our best to address those. We might address them right when we're into a specific topic, or we might wait till the very end uh, to get to them. And we will attempt to get to uh, to all of them. All right, so let's do a session or an overview of what it exactly it is we're going to talk about today. This is a case study where we're following Yvonne. And again, Yvonne is in Houston, Texas. I talked about Cypress, Texas, which is northwest Houston. Uh, and uh, in 2014, Yvonne and Morningstar, they partnered with, with Jennifer at Caldwell to build, promote, and profit from two showcase home tours. So we're going to focus on three phases of the events. Number one, we'll start off with planning and promotion. Then we'll move into executing the actual events. And then finally, we're going to look at the results. What was the return on investments, including the sales re results? So several learning outcomes today. There's really seven items we're going to go through. I can't stress it enough. If you have questions, you want to get into more details to ask them because this is it. This is your chance. We will not be doing this again unless you're going to be in, in, Las, in Las Vegas. Uh, if we get to the end of the program, like I said, we'll get into results, and you might have more questions there. But I also wanted to uh, get a little bit more information about you guys here before before we start. Who are you in, in the audience? So I'm going to launch a poll right now and really to, to find out what are the services that you guys provide. Are you just a home builder? Do you do design, build, remodeling, or do you do both? Yvonne, I do have one question while everyone's answering the poll, too. One question I think we get, when we get into, and this is probably more executing, is uh, Steve asked about selling high-performance, energy-efficient energy homes at a premium cost. I know yes. you guys have done some of that, so that's a great yes. topic. So we'll, we'll make sure we do get to your question, Steve. Thanks for putting that in. Okay, just a couple more seconds here, then I'm going to close the poll, and I will show you what we have on here for an audience. I think it's always good for us that are speaking to understand you know, what areas uh, we should focus on based on the services you provide. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and then we'll share the results here. So it looks like about 50% of you are home builders, and uh, about 40% of you also do remodeling. Yvonne, quick question for you. I know at one time you and Ted also did remodeling. Are you still remodeling, or are you just focusing slowly on home building? No, we both we do some remodeling projects. Most of the projects we do, though, are fairly whole house renovations that are probably 300000 and on up. Okay. Very good. All right. So you should be able to see on this, make sure I close this poll correctly. Do you see the sponsoring, the brand disclosure? Is that, uh, am I, are you seeing the right slide here, Yvonne? Yes. All right, wonderful. So we're going to focus on things from a home builder's perspective, and also we'll talk about some of the remodeling opportunities here as we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, one note on the materials you'll see today, you're going to see 
the brand Southern Living quite a bit. And for those of you that are, that are not uh, familiar with Southern Living, this is simply just a sponsoring brand for the event that uh, Yvonne and Jennifer uh, put on. Anytime you do an event, it's a good idea to have a sponsoring brand. Uh, a lot of you might participate with your local Home Builder Association Parade of Homes. I, I'm here in Minneapolis, and the Builders Association of the Twin Cities has, I think, one of the largest parade of homes in the country, so that is a sponsoring brand. Uh, ACID, American Society of Interior Designers, also does uh, sponsorship for events. But I do have, I have clients that will do their own personal event. You see here in the bottom right-hand corner, this is a custom home and remodeling client of mine, and we'll put on our own custom home and remodeling tour. And uh, we did this over a couple month period. So it doesn't it, it doesn't matter if you're promoting the thirty thousand dollar remodeling project or up to a two million dollar custom home. This type of event uh, works in all price ranges. Typically, this is what you'll find. You'll find the higher price the project the more attendees, but Yvonne will attest to it, not necessarily the highest quality uh, people coming through these events. There's a lot of tire kickers. And oftentimes, if you have a lower priced project that you're promoting, the opposite is true, where you're going to have lower numbers but a higher quality uh, lead coming through. Now, we're packing a whole lot of information here into one hour, and there's no way we can get through everything. So what I've done is I've put together a resource guide for you. The resource guide is going to include uh, links to examples, you know, including collateral materials, some of the web pages, the social media that we've used. It's going to get much more into the detailed explanations. And then we're going to tell you straight up, you know, what was the best and worst return on investment. So uh, after the webinar here, you're going to be able to, instead of dropping your card at the program like at the Builder Show, you're going to be able to just click on a, a button at the end of the webinar and let me know if you would like to get this uh, resource guide. I will also be doing a follow-up webinar in February. I'll make sure you get information on that too. And it will be going through some of the more intricate details from, from, the, uh, from the resource guide. All right, so let's get into planning the events. This is the first, the first phase. Just give you a, a quick overview. Uh, again, what exactly we did in 2014. So there was two events. Uh, the first event happened in May and June, and that was at Town Lake. So that was the, the name of the, uh, the neighborhood of the community uh, that, that Jennifer uh, uh, works at. And then in October and November, we did an event at Willow Creek Ranch. So the idea here is that we design, build, and we merchandise a custom home. There was partnering with local charities. We sold tickets to people to come see the uh, event. And then the home prices range from about $1.1 to $1.4 million. Obviously, Caldwell was the developer. Morningstar built all the homes. And then together, we, we promoted uh, and did all the planning. Um, I worked with Yvonne on setting up the sales funnel. We're going to get into a lot of detail on that later. And uh, a majority of the ticket prices that were sold, the proceeds did go to the two charities. And so we'll let Yvonne tell you more about that later. Okay, we're going to start with the builder-developer builder relationship. And what I want to begin with is really the developer's goals. Because if you guys are looking at partnering with a developer yourself this year, I think it's important to understand if you're going to approach this developer, you know, what are they looking to get out of the relationship? So, Jennifer, do you want to give us some insight on what your goals were going into the, to the relationship? Yeah. So, first and foremost, I mean, we saw the Showcase Home as a really fun and unique opportunity to market our community and just get feet um, through the door. So, we have an on-site welcome center at both Town Lake and Willow Creek. So, aside from just getting people to the Showcase Home, it was important for us to try to funnel some of that traffic to our welcome center so we could have them fill out a guest card and collect some information on them and continue to market to them post-event as well. So that was certainly a goal of ours, um, as well as, you know, we work with over 20 builders in Town Lake. So they all have models on site, and we wanted to, again, push that traffic out to their models to help um, everyone be mutually beneficial in this event. So we ran a, a trip promotion to help encourage traffic um, funneling out to those models as well so that our builders would, would benefit and then lastly, just you know, realtor um, awareness. We had a new custom section of Town Lake called Water's Edge that offers all custom homes. And it was fairly new in the market, and um, not all the realtors knew that we offered custom homes of that caliber. So it was a great opportunity for us to get in front of them and make sure they were familiar with our custom product within the community. So exposure all around. I think it's important to understand, too, is that you guys are new to custom builders, just like Yvonne is new to working with a developer. 
Yeah, so I mean, each of our communities are different. Willow Creek is all custom homes, um, but Town Lake, we have a good mix of each. So different sections come on board at, at different time frames. And although Town Lake has been around for six years now, um, like I said, our, our custom gated section within the community was fairly new. And Willow Creek Ranch was acreage, and you were just selling lots there, right? Right. So we do direct sales, lot sales to homeowners, and we have preferred custom builders that they can choose from to build their home on that lot. Great. Thank you. Okay, Yvonne, so if we move on to your perspective. So you're going into this relationship with, with Caldwell. What were your goals? Well, some of them were the same. Uh, the realtor exposure, of course, is an important consideration as a custom home builder. Uh, we just find that a lot of realtors don't think that about the fact that they could contact a builder and have their potential client build with a custom home builder, so that was certainly one part of it. Uh, from the public relations standpoint, branding, just trying to get our name out so that more people know about us. Like I said, we're a small volume custom home builder. Uh, just takes a while to build your brand uh, versus, and also building the pipeline. Uh, definitely need to always have people in your pipeline that are in, we're at since we're design build and so we want to have people that are in design as well as building and so that's one of the other big goals that we had. Obviously we had a house to sell and that was very important. Uh, I might just mention that actually it was a realtor that bought the home uh, shortly after the tour ended, so that was a, another goal that we met. And the second one is it related to Willow Creek Ranch was we wanted to meet as many of the lot owners out in Willow Creek who had yet had not yet chosen a builder. And so we had an opportunity, we had an event in the evening where we invited the lot owners to come to the showcase home and we were able to interface with them, talk to them about what their plans were. How many total lots were there in Willow Creek Ranch? Uh, there will be about 220 upon completion, and we had about 50 um, at the time we had our grand opening last November. Okay. And were all those sold, all 50? Uh, we currently have 16 lots available. Okay. So this, the community is coming online in phases. Okay. And, and Town Lake is obviously much, much bigger than that with the master plan community. And just to give people a perspective, for Town Lake, how many um, home sites were available in the custom home section of the community? Oh, that's a good question. So we'll have about 3,000 homes upon completion, and we're at about the almost the 50% mark in our community. So our projected build out for Town Lake is 2019. As far as the custom section, um, again, it's expanding. So I'd say 50 lots in okay. the custom section. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, let's begin with realtor outreach since that was both, uh, or Yvonne, one of the big goal uh, for you. So we're going to begin again with the planning and promotion that happened before the events. And uh, Jennifer, this really falls on, on you, where you had the existing Realtor Outreach Program in place for, for Town Lake. So t give us a little background on what your outreach program is and then how you leverage your relationships to expose realtors to the, to the events. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, Town Lake has been around for several years now, so it was really important that we developed a good rapport with the realtor community. Over two-thirds of the sales in our community are realtor-assisted, so we do a lot to kind of cater to that market and make sure they're familiar with our, our product, our community. So we do realtor events at least quarterly, whether it be a new model opening up and we have an open house or progressive lunch or just different ways to, to get in front of them. We also send out a realtor-specific quarterly newsletter that informs them of realtor events and um, new price points and things of that nature, our inventory, and then, of course, regular e-blasts as we have events to help them sell the lifestyle of the community to their clients as well. Um, we do office visits. So we have people that go on site and will take cupcakes to the offices and make sure we're constantly staying in front of them and that they have the tools necessary to make a sale in our community easy for them and, and know about our inventory. Um, so tapping into that relationship is really key for the marketing at this event and making sure that they felt knowledgeable of the event, even before the public, so that they could kind of have that upper hand when presenting this home, which was for sale, um, and all of our homes to their clients. And you, uh, uh, we have a realtor contest on here. I know Yvonne did a contest for realtors. Did you as a developer also do something? 
No, we did the dinner with the chef. With okay. Yvonne. So that was with yeah. Yvonne. Okay. And th what you see on the screen here is an example of an invitation that you sent out for an event that happened prior to the uh, um, to the Town Lake Showcase Home opening. And Yvonne, any other personal insights you want to add with this exposure to the uh, to the realtor outreach through uh, through Jennifer? I just think for a builder, any time that you can associate yourself with a developer, that also gives you more credibility as a builder. So I think for us, that was a good partnership as well. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to public relations. This was a big part um, uh, of the event. So tell us, Yvonne, you know, about working with these charities and how that tied into the, the public relations coverage that you received. Right. The two charities that we were sponsoring, giving money to were Homemade Houston, which is a the, the charitable arm of the Greater Houston Builders Association and Operation Finally Home. Both of those charities have their database that we were able to tap into as well. And Homemade especially has an arm that does a lot of the public relations type of thing and they were able to get information into the Houston Chronicle which we would not, I mean, we would have had to pay a lot of money to be able to get into but because that was the charity arm of it, a newspaper was much more likely to run anything about our showcase. And Jennifer, anything you want to add from the, the charity and the public relations perspective? Yeah, I guess just the more people you have coming in an event from different angles just gives it a wider depth in terms of PR. So, I mean, of course, we had an agenda. We had media relationships in place, and Yvonne did as well. But these charities and organizations, um, it's a lot easier for them to get PR sometimes. Um, so it's certainly beneficial to include that in any event that you do. And you did a, did you do a media day for both homes, for both Town Lake and Willow Creek Ranch? We did. So before the home opened to the public, we had a media preview day where we invited um, key media contacts out to come preview the home for free and um, invited them to take pictures. And the HBJ even did um, a video of it as well. But it gave them an opportunity to see the home first and cover it to help us, of course, get people through the door. Um, but catering to them in that manner um, served as well. We could pass out press releases and really utilize those relationships. And I know that the charities had their own media contacts, and they helped get some people there to that media day as well. Right, and we did a ribbon cutting with our local chamber, so it gave them a newsworthy angle to, to get them there. And I think this is a picture of the uh, the media day where you had your uh, yeah. Sci Fair Houston Chamber of Commerce in front of the – this is the Town Lake uh, uh, Showcase Home, I believe. Yes. Yep. And anything specific happen on this day from either of you that you know that went really, really well or things that happened that maybe didn't go well? I think having enough of us from different angles in the home. So of course we as a developer were there to answer any questions. Yvonne and Ted were there to answer any questions about the home. Our vendor partners were there to talk about their products and the charities were there to talk about their charities. So it gave a well rounded approach to the event and I think that worked really well. The media appreciated being able to talk to everyone at once and get interviews on site. Um, and then we served light refreshments and just made it more of a, a social event than anything too formal. How about you, Yvonne? Any perspective from you? Same. I would just echo what Jennifer said. And of course, since this was a Southern Living event, we always were trying to put that into the, the beverages and the foods that we offered. We always tried to have a little bit of a Southern flair to them. So. That's sponsorship branding yes. again. So let's shift over to, uh, to online promotion. We'll start with, with social media. So Jennifer, I know you as a developer, you had a really robust campaign. Can you give us some details of things that you did you know, leading up to the events on social media? Yeah, so we have our own Town Lake uh, Facebook page, but then we created an event page for the Southern Living um, Showcase Home so people could get more information there. And um, before the event, we did our pre-post, which kind of teased the market and let people know that the home was coming without giving away too much information because we wanted them to come see it. Um, we did boosted posts and, and fun things on Facebook. It also feeds through to our Twitter account, so it's double the bang for a lot less effort if you kind of combine those two accounts. So everything was fed to Twitter as well. And we tried to use a hashtag at the home. We had a banner set up where people could uh, take pictures and try to encourage them to post pictures on social media in a more organic fashion and, and really encourage that engagement by using a hashtag. So 
Um, it's one thing for us to post, but it's always nice when you can get your attendees to post on your behalf as well. So Absolutely. We, we also did a video. We have our own YouTube channel through Town Lake, so we produced a video and put it up there and promoted it on social media, and then we created an event page on our Town Lake website that talks specifically about the event and linked through to Yvonne's page and the Eventbrite link and um, fully functional. Yvonne, how about you? What did you use prior to the event on social media? Well, we also had a few videos that we had in place that we posted on YouTube and were able to use on our Facebook page. And like Jennifer, we have our, a Morning Star Builders Facebook page, but then we also created a Facebook page that was specifically for each one of our showcase homes as well. And I thought that was really genius, too, because you can obviously really focus the conversation and the engagement just on the event and really, and really build the hype. Uh, the one thing I'll mention as well is that we did use Pinterest, and uh, what we did is we created a Pinterest board for each home. So beginning with the selections, so all the finishes could be seen in the, in the homes, all the different products, and then we were able to uh, take construction photo updates during that period of time uh, before the home opened just to continue to build the buzz and, and keep people's uh, attention. Vimeo, as you see here as well, in the middle of the screen, we hosted some videos on there as well, so we put them on both Vimeo and and YouTube. So YouTube got a lot of organic uh, traffic to it, and and uh, and then Vimeo was more just the placeholder that we would use on the websites and the uh, and the blog posts. All right, so I think right away, since social media is usually a pretty good topic, is what social media do you guys think had the best return on investments? Because I know that's always something that's hard to uh, uh, hard to figure out. Is you know where should you be spending your time and effort on social media? Everyone says it's free, but it's not really free. So tell us right now what you think was the best return on investment, and then we'll have Yvonne and Jennifer tell you what their results were. Ooh, boy, Twitter's not doing so good. <laughs> All right, just a couple more seconds here that I'll show you the, the results. Looks like we have some pretty smart people in the audience here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close down the poll, and we will take a look at the results. So you all think that uh, Facebook had the highest return on investment, followed by video, YouTube and Vimeo, Vimeo, and then Pinterest. And then Twitter got the big old goose egg, Jennifer, an absolute zero, <laughs> zero percent. So we have, I think we know what people think of uh, Twitter in, in the audience today. But, but uh, uh, tell us, from your perspective, what gave you the best bang for the buck, the best return on investment? Yeah, it was definitely Facebook. I, I feel like we were able to engage more with our audience through that platform and, and then with us. And so um, I guess just the, the depth of what we're able to share via videos and pictures and posts and event pages, it just made it really um, easy for our, our users. And um, it's, it's hard to get that engagement on Twitter. So we certainly saw more um, thing for our buck on Facebook. I'll give you some quick stats. Uh, for the Facebook event page, this is from uh, Yvonne. They created the uh, the Facebook page just for the showcase homes. We had about 370 people that had liked that. There was really good engagement uh, during the event, and the reach was somewhere between five to 80 percent over the course of the event. So we got we were getting some great reach uh, during that time. The Vimeo uh, event video had about 1,300 views on it, and then Pinterest. Uh, you all are actually missing the boat on Pinterest. Pinterest had 155 people following the board, and I really see that as an up-and-coming medium. Uh, similar to, you know, it's not maybe quite as polished as House, but it allows you to really uh, create a, a, a canister, if you will, to hold a lot of your images for your, your homes and projects that you're promoting, both pre-sold and uh, on a speculative basis. Well, let's move on to uh, website and blog. Make okay. a quick comment. Um, Rick, our target market is a 47-year-old female, is what we say, whose husband's probably in oil and gas or owns his own business. And so based upon that, we felt that Facebook would be the more logical place for us to spend our money versus the Twitter. We we didn't feel that, at least in our market, that that age bracket is following Twitter as much. You know, one thing that... Uh 
is uh, this one comment on Twitter. I know it got a zero percent from the audience, and it's obviously hard to track. But one thing that you can use Twitter for is with the media. You know, a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of people that report the news will follow Twitter feeds. And, uh, you know, if you can get a Twitter feed on, you know, the hashtag that Jennifer was talking about with the showcase home, but to get something on new homes and all of you and your local uh, MSAs probably have uh, reporters that specialize in housing. So you can use Twitter to sort of get through them and get, and get public relations to get them to cover you. But we'll move on to website and blog. We're still online here. And, uh, you know, both Yvonne and Jennifer did do promotion on their respective websites. So for Morningstar, what we, what we did was we focused on showcasing the design and product elements of the homes in the blog part of the event. So what you see on the screen right now is an example of a, a, a barreled ceiling with some special, was it fiber optic lighting in the, yeah. in the barrel vault? I mean, some really, really cool stuff. So it was, it was allowed us to promote the vendors, the design elements, as well as give construction updates to, to the home. So we're, we're continuing to build that, that buzz. Uh, we also created a call to action to follow the photo updates via email or on Facebook. And then people could be notified when tickets would be available for, for purchase. So we created an overview page to, to hype the home. So uh, Jennifer, on your end, you know, how did you handle your website and blog promotion from the developer side? Yes, it sounds like it has a pretty strong website, and Yvonne and I debated quite a bit about the URL and whose site to, you know, really promote this event on, and really we did both. I mean, we figured the more opportunities for people to connect with us, the better. So we created this event page on our website, and it's important to know that as a developer, we spend a lot of money on Google AdWords and SEO and SEM and ways to really boost our website traffic. So we were getting really strong traffic, and having a, creating a really clean URL that we could use to market this event was, was beneficial in terms of billboards and print ads and things like that. So um, I think that being able to track through Google Analytics on that event page how many hits we were getting and what kind of views we were getting helped us in the pre-promotion to know kind of what to expect as far as traffic and how many people would actually come out and see the home. So it was really beneficial to have those stats at our fingertips. Let's shift to offline since you brought it up. So this is some examples of what we did offline uh, promotions. So this includes print ads and signage. So Jennifer, you at Town Lake, you did the majority of the offline advertising. So what was your strategy here with some of these print ads and, and, and billboards and signage? So for billboards, we had three billboards on major freeways surrounding the community. And they were up for at least four weeks before the event and then throughout the event itself um, through grand opening. Print ads, we did some magazine ads and um, local publications. I think there were three to four local publications that we ran full page ads in. And you can see we used all of our vendor logos and um, really tried to drive traffic to the website to get those ticket sales. And then we also had event signage on site, um, one big 8x8 in front of the home, and then another large 8x8 sign on the main thoroughfare that feeds into our community. So just capitalizing on people who were driving by and familiar in, in the area um, with some of the pre-promotion. And then we also ran radio ads to help promote before the event. And events was a, a large portion of it, too. We had a groundbreaking nine months out where we invited the chamber and those realtors to come out and really build excitement about what's coming with the home. And then, of course, we talked about the media preview day. And we did an exclusive realtor event, too, where they could come preview the home for free before it opened to the public and, and share that information with their clients. And then we even did a local, what we called, VIP event of local executives who could actually afford to buy the custom home. So it was a more qualified, targeted audience that we invited to come see it and have wine and hors d'oeuvres in the home that night. So lots of events to really get the buzz going about the home. Yvonne, anything you want to add here to the offline promotion that Jennifer hasn't already touched on? No, I think most of the time we just collaborated and really tried to, to focus where with where is it that we could reach our target market. So I'm always looking at things from a marketing perspective, kind of like, like Jennifer and how this ties into the sales funnel, which we're going to talk about here, uh, I think, in the next section. Uh, it's really, you should make a note that all this offline ads and signage, all the call to actions were really 
to go to the website. So if you look at an example here, the billboard that we're showing up here, you know, buy tickets at Town Lake, Texas. Uh, it was always to, you know, go to one of the websites, learn more about the event, and to, and to purchase your, t your tickets. So anytime you have something that's offline, um, you know, instead of trying to push people to go to, like, say, your model home or to, you know, drive to that area, it's much, much easier to get them to go to your online uh, marketplace or your online model home. Uh, and then that way what Jennifer was talking about is that you can track, you know, how those people came there uh, based on when that ad runs through your Google Analytics. So, um you know, we were able to track all this stuff, and then in the results section, we'll show you kind of what was the success of our pre-promotion, uh, our pre, our pre-event promotion. So, Jennifer, you stole my thunder a little bit because you started. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you you already kind of said, "Hey, yeah, radio and events," but I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, we started marketing nine months before the event. We did a groundbreaking. So, in the bottom left-hand corner here, you'll see the the groundbreaking photo with the gold the gold shovels. So there was a tremendous amount of time from when the event really officially kicked off at the groundbreaking and when it actually opened its doors to, to the public. Now Jennifer, one question I had for you is radio. You incorporated radio into your promotion schedule. What was really your goal there and, and when did you time those ads? We had two different spots that ran for about a two-week campaign, and it was the week before and the week of the opening, I believe, and it was just to build awareness and, um, again, drive that traffic to the website um, to get people in the door, really, and then once it opened, it kind of encouraged people to tell their friends and, and keep coming. And Yvonne, uh, you did the three events. You did one for realtors, a media day, and then your VIP event. Uh, from from your perspective, uh, from the builder's perspective, what were those like, and how did they how did they turn out in your mind? The realtor event. It's always good to be in front of realtors and have an opportunity to showcase your product. Uh, it was great from that perspective. The media day. Once again, we even benefited from that. Uh, several, I guess, two months after the event. We were on the front cover of a local sci fair like lifestyle magazine that we hadn't even knew that we were going to be able to be on, and that was sort of a side benefit that came as a result of that. So you never know on those media days what kind of networking you might find or what kind of other opportunities there might be as well. It's all about the relationships, right? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's right. very cool. Hey, I had a quick question for you. You mentioned that the model home in Town Lake, you ultimately sold that to a realtor. Did that realtor attend the, the realtor event? No, that realtor did not. Okay, but they heard about it from somebody that did attend, right? I believe so, yes. Ah, <laughs> perfect. All right. Jennifer, this is a backdrop that you made for photos at, at these events. So how did you use this backdrop? Yeah, so this is really what we tried to do to encourage our social media, and we had a little sign by it that said, take your picture, post it on Facebook, use this hashtag, and it had all these cool logos. I was so excited about it, and to be honest, it really just didn't work as well as I had hoped. It's, it's hard to get people on board with using those hashtags sometimes. Um, I think part of it was placement. This one was kind of in an awkward location, and it wasn't as easy for people to get in front of and take a picture. It was in the garage. And I think also if we would have made it a little bit more fun, like maybe had southern hats and fans and sweet tea or props that people could have posed with, maybe it would have been more engaging. So you've got to try, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's worth a try. But, yeah, I'm, I'm disappointed to say it didn't work as well as I had hoped. Yeah, live and, and learn, right? So the, the showcase home where the hashtag is up there above, that's what the attempt was to use on Twitter and Facebook to uh, to build a string kind of everything going on. And the idea is, is you get your participants, the people that are liked your page or following your Twitter feed, you know, to continue to use that. And, and you even I know you said you even tried a contest to get people to use the, the, the hashtag, and that didn't even work, right? Yeah, we said we, you know, look on Facebook every, I don't remember, I guess week, and pick a winner based on what they posted, and um, we did something similar in Willow Creek, too. It was October, so we had pumpkins, and we had this cute chalkboard set up, and um, it's just hard to get people to actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard. So, there, note to self, if you guys are, you know, following this, is that, you know, Social media is great, but it, it does have its limitations, and you know, don't expect that everything is, is going to work that you try. But the important thing is to try. And I love the idea, by the way. You know, I've got 
eight and ten year old kids and you go to the to those places where you can stick your face in something you have like you know the funny hats yeah. or whatever like that that would have been a great idea for the for the photos they have some more fun with it all right well we're going to shift into now the actual event itself and executing and I think it's important for us to understand what is your you know your sales team uh, like what's your what's your sales process so uh, tell us are you an owner that sells uh, do you have maybe a one salesperson or do you have a sales team with two or more salespeople then we're gonna let Yvonne give you a little bit of background on what her setup is like and how they managed uh, how they manage that Ooh, the voting's pretty interesting on, on this one. So take a few more seconds here. Let's take about uh, five more seconds. If you haven't voted, make sure you vote, and then we will uh, show the results. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and close the poll, and then we are going to share the results. So it looks like we have a somewhat balanced uh, approach here. The majority of you are owners who sell. Uh, and then it looks like number two is you've got a two or more people on your sales team, and then uh, the least majority of you have one person as, as a salesperson. So, Yvonne, give us some background on your sales team and, and your sales process. Well, I am in the first category. I am an owner who sells, and so working with Rick uh, as to be a support during this whole event was a huge, huge component as well as working with Jennifer to pull off either one of these events. Just Morning Star Builders by themselves would have been next to impossible, just didn't have the manpower, didn't have the resources, so it's great from that standpoint to have partners that could come alongside and help during that. Um, as far as the actual event, my job was generally to be at the door to greet the people and I kind of asked questions regarding if they knew the neighborhood, if they owned a lot out there, those kinds of questions. And then from that, I would funnel them if they seemed a hot prospect over to Ted, and he would be the one that would actually spend more time with them. And Ted's your uh, husband, just to clarify. Yes. I don't think we've introduced Ted yet. Yes. But, yes. but exactly right. I think you, you know, you're an owner who sells. The majority you have doing that. So when you try to put, you know, put together an event like this, it's imperative that you are there. If you ha but you guys supplemented with the sales team, which we're going to talk about here in, in a second as far as your staffing, which I thought was really an ingenious uh, idea. Let's go ahead and let's move on and let's talk about the sales funnel. Now, I mentioned that we were, going to, we were going to spend a little bit of time discussing this before we got into actually executing the event. Every builder needs to have a clearly defined sales funnel, period. Unfortunately, what I find is very few actually do. Uh, your funnel, once you design it, it needs to be adjusted based on the different lead generation activities. So think of this, this is just one big lead generation activity for us. So what I want to do is I'm going to walk you through the funnel that I designed for Yvonne for these two events, and then I want to we go through on what's on the screen right now and tell you how we, care, how we categorize the different participants in, in our event. So the funnel was uh, pretty simple. It was a three-step process. It was uh, a contact. Everyone began as a contact. They moved to a lead. Then they became a prospect and ultimately became a buyer. So the definition of a contact is pretty simple. So a contact is someone that's simply aware of you. Uh, so uh, uh, they're aware of you through either a sphere of influence, it might be a realtor because the event's aware of you, it might be someone that you've done business with in the past, but they're aware of you, so they're a contact. Then we move on to a D lead. So a D lead has expressed interest online, and I'm going to show you in a second how we were able to filter through and figure out who was a legitimate lead versus someone that was just buying a ticket to, to see the home. A C lead at this point is somebody that you've had a conversation with, but they've indicated that for whatever reason, their purchase decision is more than 12 months out. Now, a lot of times, you'll simply just let them go. You know, call me when you're ready. But in this case, we did have a strategy for staying in touch with them, staying top of mind, where we can reel them in when they're getting closer to a purchase decision. Then we move to an A or a B prospect. So we're getting down farther into the funnel now, towards the bottom. An A or B prospect is where Yvonne gets to have a two-way conversation, or if you're a salesperson, you get to have a two-way conversation with someone, and they are ready, willing, and or able. The difference between an A and a B prospect is the ability to buy, and that usually comes down to financing. And then ultimately, 
hey, someone signs on the dotted line, we create a buyer. So here's an overlay of how it worked for this particular event. A contact was someone that either entered one of our contests or bought a ticket. If somebody, when we, what we use is the call to action so someone could download the specs. So if you've ever been to events like this, there's not much more annoying than when you're at about the third or fourth day of the event and you've been asked at least 56 times what the paint color is in the kitchen. And so what we did is we created a specifications form that had all the different products and vendors and colors in a document and then we allow people to go online and download it. Now we, it's important to understand when we did that, and I'll talk about that in a future slide. So if somebody were to download the specs, we automatically filtered and converted them from uh, just someone who purchased a ticket to someone who might be a legitimate uh, buyer. In this case, they were a D-lead. Yvonne has a phone call. She meets someone at the, at the event itself. She has an initial conversation with someone, finds out that, hey, they are, a, they are a good prospect, or in the future they will be, but they have some sort of reason that's going to preclude them from making a purchase decision within 12 months. So then she's going to move them to a C lead, and she will schedule her follow-up accordingly. Then we move in to where we have a conversation that someone has urgency. So they're going to make a purchase decision within 12 months, and or they have the ability to buy. So they could be an A prospect, ready, willing, and able. They could be a B prospect where they're ready and willing, or they may have a home to sell. They may be getting financing put together. They may be waiting for a bonus at, at work to come up with the cash for down payment, whatever it is. And then finally, we get a buyer. So that's how the sales funnel works. Now, it's very, very imp imperative that you understand you've got to automate part of this. When you see the, the numbers that Yvonne was dealing with, it would be absolutely impossible for her to properly filter through all these things without automating uh, part, of, part of the process. This is how we did that, that automated filtering process. So when somebody became aware of us, whether they had pit, purchased a ticket or maybe they just wanted to entry, enter the contest, um, we had them fill out a survey online or a web form online. We, we captured their information. So in this case, what you see as the example on the screen is, Yvonne did a contest that she had a professional chef from Thermador Appliances that someone could win a dinner party for them and seven friends at the showcase home. And then this professional chef, Robbie Renzel, uh, would come in and, and put it on for him. So it's a really f a fun contest. While someone filled out that form, we asked them a question. Hey, would you like information on building a custom home? If they answered yes, then we would ask them when would they like to talk about their project, and they could choose the time of day, and then they would be able to put in the specific items they'd like to discuss. And if they said no, we just let them enter the contest. So that was the first way we filter people out is through, through the contest. The second way we did it is if they were on the overview page, we allowed them to download the specifications before and after buying a ticket. So someone could have been just following along on Facebook, they could have been getting email updates, and we would allow them to download the specs. If they did that, we'd ask them the same question again. Would you like information on building a custom home? And if they did say yes, we automatically automatically change them in the system from a contact to a, to a D-lead. Yvonne uses a software called Web Marketing Automation. And what this does is really it, it manages everything we're talking about right now, right down through the entire sales process. So from ticket sales into uh, converting people to D-leads, ultimately to, to managing prospects and, and uh, getting them into being a, a buyer. So as you can see here, we had a link on the overview page that would take them to where they could download the specs. And then after they bought a ticket in our thank you email, we gave them another link to download the specs. Now, Yvonne, you were at the, I know we discussed this quite a bit, because when you were at the event and you got asked these questions, oh, what's the paint color, what's the type of appliances, what's this flooring, what process did you use to direct people to, to download the specs? Well, we did it a couple of different ways. One time we printed off a postcard that had, gave the web address of the downloading of the specs so that I could hand that to them. That way they could walk out the door with something they, the, and another showcase we did, we just said go to our website and take a look at what the specs are from, you know, when you went to our web page. So 
get them back to the website. That's the moral. If you, if you haven't figured that out yeah. here, that's the moral of the story. It doesn't matter if you're doing billboards, if you're doing Facebook stuff, if you're doing Twitter, you know, whatever it is, get them back to your, to your website. So once we got people um, to the website and we got them to opt in, so they said, yep, I want to register to win this contest or I want to follow the, the updates. We had a challenge. As we mentioned before, there was a nine months before the actual event in Town Lake where we did a groundbreaking. So we had people that were interested in the home nine months before they had the actual event. And we, <laughs> we got to the beginning of it and I said, Yvonne, okay, what do we have? What can we promote? What sort of imagery can we use to show some of the design elements? And so what she was able to do is go back and beg the architect to come up with some hand drawings. So if you see in the bottom left-hand corner here, we just got some simple three-dimensional hand drawings. And then once the home was framed up, we, I think with, you might, I'm not sure how you bribed Ted to do this, but whatever you did work, but you said, Ted, go in and shoot some videos <laughs> when the yeah. home was framed up. So here's what's really cool, what Ted did, though is you see where he's standing, that is the same as the artist rendering here. This is the master bathroom and some of the archways where the tub is. And Ted had designed this really cool, well, I, Yvonne, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like a window with a, a skylight built into it, so yeah. there was some natural light coming into the bathroom. And as far as I remember from the video, he told the story of where he talked to the manufacturer about this, and the manufacturer had never done anything like this before. That is correct. And so they were... They were like, yes, we'll give you that because nobody's ever done that before. And so we got free product because of what he had created in his mind. So how cool is that? And what a great story to tell. So people, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's such a great story. And then what in the video, what Ted did was he said, well, here I am in the master bathroom. And then they would do a, a, a fadeaway, and then they would show this artist rendering, which you see in the, in the bottom left right in the video. So it was a great way to continue to build that buzz to want us continue to see updates and get excited about all these design elements and products that were going in. Now, Facebook. So we remember I said we had 360, 370 people on Facebook. But the challenge with Facebook is how do I, if they're just on my Facebook page, I don't know who they are. So how do I get them off of Facebook and get them into my, uh, my database so then I can track what, what they're doing? So we use an app called Fangate. And prior to someone liking the page, we gave them an opportunity to go ahead and enter the contest. So they would see, if they haven't liked the page yet, this particular image would come up and they would say, hey, like us to follow the progress updates. And they would say, register here. They would click on that. That would take them back to the registration page on Yvonne's website. They would fill out the form there. And then we had captured their information. We'd put them into the database. And then we could continue to, to market to them building that buzz prior to, to the event. Now, Pinterest, which I, I don't have an example of on here, but Pinterest was used to really showcase all those selections. And that is really a great use for, for Pinterest. When you have a home under construction, it's in an ugly duck stage, you have all these beautiful selections made but no one knows about. You build a Pinterest board like we did here for the home, put all the selections on there, and then as the construction progresses, we can post periodic updates and encourage people to follow the Pinterest board. When the event finally opens or you have the open house, you can do another update right on Pinterest to direct them to go back to your website in RSVP or buy tickets in this case to, to come to the event. So we had 155 people following the Pinterest board and had you know some really good interaction on there. So now someone's opted in. How do we stay top of mind over that, that, that period? Well, this was an example of an email that we sent out, and we took all the renderings that the architect had done just to show them, hey, here's some of the things that are, are going to be in the home and how fun it's going to be. And again, we would encourage people to continue to follow those progress updates on Facebook and Pinterest, and uh, um, we would email people too. So we gave them the option if they wanted to see the update via email. Uh, we could, they could click back through to a blog post on the website or they could just follow the updates um, uh, on Facebook, whatever they preferred. All right, so now we're getting just before the event. And we got closer and closer. So what we did is we opened up ticket sales. And then we continued to promote the contest, the Dinner with the Chef uh, contest. Every time that a ticket was purchased online, 
we captured the information. That's what's really cool is we integrated with the shopping cart. So when someone will go in and go, yep, I want to buy a ticket, they put it in their information there, we automatically captured that da data, moved it over to Yaman's system, and now she had a contact in her system. And then she could start you know, tracking that, moving to a lead, moving to a prospect, and ultimately becoming a buyer. So it was hands-off. It happened in her sleep. Uh, Yvonne, what did you give us a little background on, on your strategy for charging for a ticket? Because I see this ticket says twelve dollars, but what were the ticket prices and, and how did you structure that? Yes, that's always a challenge. Uh, Jennifer and I talked about it to some degree that you know what is what is appropriate for that and since these were individual homes, people were going to be paying ten or twelve dollars. We had a price that if if they purchased it online, it would be ten dollars and if they bought it at the door it would be twelve. Uh, at the first showcase. And then the second one, because it was a homeowner that actually owned the home, she requested that it be a higher price. So we charged $15 for that ticket. So we gave them an incentive to purchase online versus yes. uh, on, on site. And remember, the majority of the proceeds here were going to charity. So uh, it, was, it was still a good thing even if you're charging tickets. But this is an important note. Please make this, uh, write this down. If you want to do an event like this, even if you don't charge people for you to tour your project, let's say it's going to be free, maybe the tickets are free. Make them RSVP online so you can capture their information. So you still go through that process, and that was most important for us. I mean, we wanted to, to get some money to help offset some of that marketing cost. We definitely wanted to donate to the charities. But the most important thing here was figuring out a way to capture the data of the thousands of people that came through and sort of make it a lot easier to make the sale down the road. Okay, so during the event is happening, we're doing some follow-up here. So we made a big push to get anyone that was following online to come out to the homes. And we had, a, we had a very limited time. I think it was four or five weeks for the actual tour, uh, Thursday through Sunday or, or uh, uh, Friday through Sunday. So we used the urgency, and we promoted it on email, Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter. You know, come out and buy tickets and, and visit the site. Uh, so one note, we did use an app on site to sell tickets that would still allow us to capture the contact information. It was like a swipe. Someone could pull their credit card out, swipe it, we would still capture that information. If they paid cash, then we had to work hard because we, you know, we, we had to try to figure out, well, are you real? Are you just a tire kicker? And it was, it was much more difficult to figure it out if they were uh, legitimate. Now, Jennifer, you were using Twitter updates too. How did you change your Twitter strategy you know, from before the event to... to uh, the actual event itself? Well, in the beginning, initially, like you said, you didn't have a lot of photography assets, and it just wasn't ready yet. So you had to really tease the market. And, um, and again, you didn't want to give away the whole show. You wanted to give them a reason to come out and see the home. So um, once the home did open, we would post a few pictures here and there and use testimonials of people who came and said, yeah, it was great. I brought my mom. We had a really good time. I loved the home. So kind of that word of mouth and grassroots marketing on our social media channels. And then towards the end, it was more of that countdown. Okay, last chance, seven more days to see the home. So just continually building that um, excitement. So now we get to actually executing the event. So these were the, uh, the details of the event. It, again, it was Thursday through Sunday for the first event. We did 11 to 6, 11 to 4, Friday through Sunday. Um, as I mentioned before, we had a ticket scanner with a QR code and a smartphone app, so someone could either print off a ticket, we could scan it that way, or they could just put it on their smartphone and we could scan it, scan it that way. Now, Yvonne, tell me a little bit about staffing. Okay, so you're an owner who sells, but you, I thought, did something really cool with your, with your vendors as it relates to staffing. We invited our vendors that wanted to to partner with us and be there to showcase there and answer questions that anybody might have regarding their specific product. We found that to be very helpful. Uh, we had some motorized screens on the back porch and the gentleman that sold that was able to be there and a lot of people had questions about that. The interior designer was there. So we just felt that that really helped in that way. We didn't have to pay so much for other people to be staffing there. You know, I had someone at the registration table and uh, Ted and I were there just walking through the house as well as a couple of other people. So be back. So you were charging tickets for people to come through, but then you had Monday through Wednesday or Monday through Thursday were non-event hours. So how did you handle you know those non-event hours and, and working with those be backs? 
we would go ahead and schedule times. If there was someone that's during the show that expressed interest, we would schedule a time that they could come back when there was nobody else in the house and they could spend more time just walking and looking at the house. We would also continue to invite other realtors. We had other VIPs. Um, we just tried to utilize it basically every waking minute. We also invited any of our vendors if they had events that they wanted to have at the house. Emser Tile provided a lot of the tile for us in this house, and they had a special event one evening where they invited all of the management people in the area to come and see their product in, you know, in a showcase home. So that's what we wanted to do was we wanted to as we partnered with people to make sure that they felt like that they were getting a win out of it as well. And uh, uh, Jennifer, regarding the actual event itself, um, you had a you had something that you did to get more exposure to Town Lake. What was that? Yeah, so we gave away a trip to South Carolina to go with the whole Southern Motif um, to encourage people to get to our Welcome Center and fill out a guest card there. It was a drawing. So um, once they go to our Welcome Center and fill out that guest card, we collect their email and their zip code and if they're in the market. So it helps us to continue that marketing process post-event. Yvonne, you had a couple of tricks, too, that you, between qualifying questions and some registration cards and setting appointments, what did you guys use to, to maximize your time during the event? Well, we did things, so if anybody filled out a registration card, it was on a white card, and then if we got, if they came in the door and they started asking more questions as I qualified them and they appeared to be more of a hot lead, then I wrote their information down on a green card, and that way Ted would know <laughs> without me having to just go and say, this is somebody you need to talk to, I would have that information to be able to pass off to him, and that way we could, even as we were just flipping through all the cards that came through, because we had nearly 4,000 people come through the first event and about 1,300 on the second. And so just going through all those cards, it just really helped to be able to get to what the ones we wanted to spend our time with very quickly. Yep, great, great filtering strategy. Uh, and then as far as setting appointments, you know, a lot of you, you mentioned that you, you went for the jugular. I mean, you went for the clothes right at the event versus trying to follow up for, for appointment setting. Is that right? Right. Yes, and I think that's always important because they're there, they're in the moment, they are excited about what they see, and you want to capture that and make you know just continue that ball rolling. We have a video that we discovered prior to this. The audio did not transfer over into uh, uh, into the go to webinar system here, so the video is going to be available uh, in the resource guide. So that is Jennifer's beautiful smiling face, and you will not be able to. <laughs> To, uh, to to see her to see her any more than that on the video, but let's drum roll, please. Let's get into the results. I think this is the fun part. I mean, why do we do all this work and promotion and spend all this money? What were the results? So this is what we know from a realtor outreach. We know that we had over a hundred realtors attend the two uh, events. Of course, there was hundreds of emails sent out to realtors, and ultimately, as you know. The, the first model in Town Lake sold to a, a realtor. So Yvonne got a ton of exposure there. Now, as far as context, these are people that had purchased tickets electronically. We were able to put 1,049 co total contacts into Yvonne's system, of which about 900 were new. Now, I mentioned before, what is a metric you can use to track the effectiveness of your, of your promotional campaign? And what we found was is that about 37% of our uh, ticket sales were online. So almost four out of uh, uh, every 10 people that came to the show saw one of our advertisements or social media uh, or got to our website and were able to uh, purchase a ticket online. We did a contest. 316 people registered for the contest. So that, that was fantastic. Now, Let's get down to brass tacks. So these are our, our, our contacts. How many of those converted to leads? Uh, about 183 converted to, to leads. That's about 18%. So that's, you know, that's really exciting. And remember, what is a lead? Someone that has made a, um, uh, some sort of an online gesture, it's like, like downloading specs or, or doing something else that they are interested in more than just walking through a pretty home. They're interested in actually building a home. 368 of the people downloaded specs, and when we uh, would allow people to download specs or register for the contest, we asked them if they'd like more information on home building. There was 52 people that did that. 
And of those 52 people, uh, they, uh, Yvonne got a chance to talk to them. You know, she got an email notification that someone wants is interested, and she was able to get back to them right away. Now, this is what also is interesting, is you've got all of this buzz going on in these events, which is driving more people to your website. We had a lot of other lead capture tools available on the website. And during the May-June event, outside of anything that we did at the showcase or, you know, the context ticket sales, any of that, we, we generated an additional 266 leads. And leads and prospects during that time. That's outside of everything here. So you talk about I mean, just a huge amount of, um, of people coming in and getting an exposure to uh, to Morningstar. In the second event, as Yvonne mentioned, you know, the, there wasn't as much marketing. The 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 uh, attendance was down. There was still an additional 51 people that did opt in during during that month. So in one month alone, on average, Yvonne put 133 additional leads and prospects into her month. That's probably more than a lot of you do for an entire year. And that was that was in in one month. So you can look at the the exposure there was pretty incredible. Now moving forward down the sales funnel, how many of those leads of those 183 leads converted into prospects? There was 58. From those 58, we've gotten seven design agreements, and to date, right now, there have been five pre-solds plus one model sale of about 5.8 million dollars in sales volume from these two events to date. To date. Now here said something that's interesting is the average amount of time on average for Yvonne for the entire year for her to convert a lead to a prospect took about six and a half months. That was the average amount of time. But these buyers, however, they converted on average in only 27 days. And then when she got into converting prospects into buyers, it was an average of about 269 days or, or, or nine months. So it's a long sales cycle, as, as you can see. So here's growth numbers for, for the company. So 2013, sales volume was about 4.35. It was up 36% for 2014. And projected 2015 closed sales volume based on the design agreements, the A and B prospects that Yvonne already has without doing any additional uh, uh, sales this year, they've already got about $10.8 million in the pipeline. It's now a 37% increase. The cycle time from where someone comes in as a lead to where they actual, actually buy, just under 10 months. Just under 10 months. So someone came through her showcase home in November this year. She could be looking at making a sale in, in August, potentially. So Yvonne, give us a little bit of background on these projected sales. I know I was talking to you guys about this, and you said we've already we've got these people locked and loaded, ready to go. Um, these are all starts that are going to happen in 2015. Is that right? That is correct. And we just actually had somebody come in uh, just last night and just sent me an email this morning saying that they want to go ahead and build start the design build process so we'll be able to even increase that number more another design deposit that's that's fantastic so I think the lesson here is this for all of you listening the faster you convert from each stage the higher the likelihood to get the sale and if you have long slow conversions it's always going to reduce the probability of getting the sale so quickly 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 get them off the street convert them into a prospect have your conversations get your design deposit and ultimately move them through your design process and into a, a purchase agreement uh, the charitable results I thought this was incredible Yvonne you guys donated almost thirty thousand dollars to these two charities mm -hmm. we were very grateful to be able to do that It was awesome how fun to hand people a check for that and really make yeah. a, a difference in people's lives so final thoughts and questions um, Steve, you had asked a question again on selling high-performance, energy-efficient homes. We are running a little bit behind here, so we're probably going to have to get back to you uh, offline on that. But uh, my final thoughts to you is to make sure whatever you're doing is to have that sales funnel in place and be ready to make adjustments on the fly. You know, automate when you, when you can and make sure everything is tied together. Uh, you know, from contact all the way to to buyer. Yvonne, any final thoughts on from your perspective? You need to have something in place to be able to help you. We did a showcase back in 2011 and did not have any of that kind of support that Rick is talking about. And my my follow-up was just not very good at all. It wasn't consistent and it wasn't reliable and I didn't have numbers to track. This was like a, an entirely different experience. Jennifer, how about your perspective? Any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, from a developer standpoint, I just would like to encourage each of you to not be 
be afraid to approach a developer with really unique marketing ideas that you come up with. Um, we've got some stiff competition out there with other MPCs, so we're always looking for unique marketing angles, and um, there's a lot we can bring to the table to help make it successful, but it's certainly mutually beneficial for both parties. So get creative. Very well, very well put. Very well put. Well, if you'd like to get a copy of the resource guide, you just answer yes on the survey when you exit the webinar. Uh, I've also got an, something brand new this year called my online training academy. We're going we're gonna to train people in, in like two to three week uh, courses on how to do a lot of the things like we just discussed. Uh, and also, if you're interested in the functional sales system that Yvonne is using to run our marketing, lead generation, and sales, just mark a note on that survey there that you'd like to get more information on it, and I'll be happy to provide that for you. I want to thank everyone for their, for their time here today, and uh, thank Yvonne and thank Jennifer. Uh, Steve, we'll get back to you offline here on your, on your question, and uh, uh, all of you have a great rest of your week. Thanks now.